This episode covers the topic of child abuse, and some may find this quite upsetting. This is the continuation of the Moira Anderson story. So far, we have told you about 12-year-old Moira Anderson's disappearance in 1957 and her likely murder, and about how, 35 years later, a revelation made by Sandra Brown's father, Alexander Gartshore, led her down a path that not only uncovered horrific secrets her family had been hiding, but also a possible indication of what might have happened to Moira Anderson. Part two ended with us finding out that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service had ruled that there would be no further proceedings in regard to the charges of lewd and libidinous behaviour against Sandra's five cousins by her father. Devastated by this decision, Sandra felt she had no choice but to try and seek a private prosecution. But with many obstacles in the way, would she be successful? In August 1992, reporting and news coverage continued in both Scotland and Leeds about a pensioner in Leeds being questioned and investigated in connection with Moira Anderson's disappearance. However, no link had as yet been made to this pensioner and the man being accused of childhood sexual abuse by a group of women back in Courtbridge. And with the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service not willing to take the child sexual abuse charges any further and it being reported in the news that the pensioner in Leeds was currently on bail pending the same Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service making a decision on whether to press charges against the pensioner in connection with Moira Anderson's disappearance, who the Crown obviously knew was one and the same man, Sandra didn't hold out much hope of the decision being a positive one. And so she made the decision to contact local reporter Eileen McCauley, who had been diligently covering and reporting on the reinvestigation into Moira Anderson's disappearance, and a reporter that Detective Inspector Jim McEwen knew well and respected. Sandra and Eileen met up, and while they did talk about the child sexual abuse charges that had been brought by Sandra's cousins and about the man being questioned and investigated in Leeds around the disappearance of Moira Anderson, Sandra did not disclose at that time their full names or their exact relationship to her, despite Eileen promising confidentiality. At this initial meeting, the pair agreed that Sandra's first step would be to write to the local MP that two of Sandra's cousins were constituents of, asking them to arrange a meeting be set up with the Lord Advocate for Scotland to try and overturn the Procurator Fiscal and Crown Office's decision, while Eileen would write an article for her newspaper telling of how the daughter of a 73-year-old man who lived in Copebridge in the 50s was seeking a private prosecution, claiming that he had sexually abused four of his female family members when they were children, with the article going on to state that a private prosecution was having to be sought due to the fact that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service had ruled it was not in the public interest to pursue this despite children potentially still being at risk from this man, as well as there being no issue with corroboration, which is a key requirement with cases in Scotland, as a mechanism known as Murov Doctrine would apply, which, according to scotlawcom.gov, is when a person is accused of two or more separate offences, connected in time and circumstances. And so the fact that four of Sandra's cousins had made allegations of sexual abuse by Sandra's father when they were children would seem to fulfil the corroboration criteria for the case to go ahead. Following Sandra writing to the local MP, John Smith, he telephoned Sandra and after a lengthy chat he advised he would try his best to help and he agreed to write to the Lord Advocate, who at the time was Lord Roger, and request a meeting be held to discuss the case further. He also suggested that Sandra contact her own MP, Lord James Douglas Hamilton, to perhaps add extra weight, which Sandra did, and who also agreed to write to the Lord Advocate and request a meeting to discuss the sexual abuse allegations and why this was not going to be pursued. Now, all Sandra had to do was wait for replies. However, at this point, Sandra decided that she had waited long enough. It was now in 1993, almost a year since her world had been changed forever following her confronting her father. She needed to know for sure if she too had been sexually abused by her father. And so she attended a hypnotist where, slowly, year after year, memory by memory, the hypnotist took Sandra back in time with little worry, until they reached early 1957, when Sandra would have been seven years old. 
Here, when Sandra spoke, her voice was that of a child. She spoke of being in bed with the flu, of arguing with children at her school who said to her that her father wasn't in hospital but instead had been sent to a bad place. She spoke of her father always wanting to play with her and her friends and of him touching her friends under their clothing and of her father giving her money and ice cream and telling her not to tell anyone but of ignoring her dad and telling her mum anyway what her dad was doing with her friends and her mum not believing her. Sandra also recalled many of her friends telling her they could no longer play with her, as her dad did funny things to them. Sandra, as a child, also spoke about a time that she'd been at the park with a friend, and she'd seen her dad in his car parked at the park, and he'd been talking to two girls and making them laugh at what he was showing them at the bonnet of his car. Sandra recalled that as she approached her dad's car, the two girls ran off laughing. Young Sandra said that she had told her mother about this too, but that her mother again hadn't believed her, and her father punished her for telling on him by burning her with his hot teaspoon, with Sandra's childlike voice saying on the recording, It's sore. The two girls that Sandra's father had been talking to at the park that day was a girl called Beth and Moira Anderson. Over multiple sessions, the hypnotist took Sandra all the way back to when she was about three or four years old, and despite Sandra remembering a time when she had been visited by a doctor at home as she had pain passing urine, remembering it being extremely sore, to her immense relief, she could not recall ever being touched by an adult where she felt this pain. After the sessions, the hypnotist assured Sandra that she did not believe she had been a sexual abuse victim of her father's. While Sandra was waiting to hear back from the two MPs regarding a meeting being made with the Lord Advocate, she decided to seek further advice from experts around possibly launching a private prosecution. If the Procurator Fiscal stuck to his guns about not pursuing the child sexual abuse case against her father. However, the information and advice she received did not fill her with hope. She was told that proceeding privately with a prosecution would put Sandra and her whole family under immense scrutiny, from reporters who would have a field day that a man's daughter was pursuing sexual abuse allegations against him, and they would likely make it out as an act of revenge for abandoning her when she was a child. Sandra's family, including her children, would also suffer, and there was a chance that her children would be picked on at school for what their mother was doing. There was also Sandra's four cousins who were making the allegations. They would have their lives picked apart and their stories laid bare for all, both in and out of court, as well as having to face their alleged abuser in court. And then there was also the possibility Sandra and her husband and her cousins could end up in financial ruin, possibly losing their homes if they did not qualify for legal aid help. It was quite the blow to Sandra's confidence and plan of being able to fight against the Procurator Fiscal and Crown Office Service's decision and seek a private prosecution. But there were more blows yet to come before the end of 1993. Detective Inspector Jim McEwen, who had so diligently reinvestigated Moira Anderson's disappearance and interviewed Sandra's father following her disclosing his confession to her, was being moved, out of the blue, from Airdrie CID to Clyde Bank, on the other side of Glasgow. While he said he would technically still be in charge of the case, how would it be possible for him to keep control and actively continue to investigate Alexander Gartshore's involvement in Moira Anderson's disappearance from a different police station, with other work to be carried out? And then shortly after this, in October 1993, Sandra received letters from both MPs John Smith and Lord James Douglas Hamilton, who had received a response from the Lord Advocate in relation to the Procurator Fiscal and Crown Office Services' decision to not proceed with the sexual abuse case against Alexander Gartshore, and neither letter was good news for Sandra or her cousins. The letter stated that following careful consideration, the Crown Office had instructed that there would be no criminal proceedings against Alexander Gartshore, and that the Lord Advocate, having reviewed the information and evidence presented, agreed with this decision, and again advised that the Crown Office was not obliged to disclose the reasons for their decision. 
The Lord Advocate's letter also praised the Procurator Fiscal, finding him and his reports thorough, helpful and professional, stating that he was saddened that Sandra had decided to criticise him and his decision, despite the Procurator Fiscal meeting with Sandra on behalf of her family and endeavouring to discuss the matter rationally and sensitively with her. So now what? Sandra was feeling like every avenue to try and see Alexander Gartshore brought to justice was quickly shut down. She knew she had to try and speak to the Lord Advocate herself to try and plead her case. Despite Detective Jim McEwen having now moved to a new police station, he and Sandra did keep in touch and he was still trying hard to continue to maintain control on the reinvestigation of Moira Anderson's disappearance and he had even received permission to have a pond near the route where Alexander Gartshore's bus would have taken on the day Moira went missing, filtered and searched by frogmen, a process that took weeks to complete but sadly turned up nothing. However, as one door closed, another one opened, when finally a reporter had made the connection that the pensioner in Leeds being interviewed in connection with the disappearance of Moira Anderson and the pensioner who used to live in Coatbridge that was being accused by family members of childhood sexual abuse were one and the same person. While this story was widely reported, thankfully Alexander Gartshore was not named in the articles, as if he had been, he may not have been able to have been brought to trial, as his solicitors could have argued that it would not be fair or unprejudiced. Sandra did speak to a trusted reporter, though, to give her side of the story, with the headline of the article next to a picture of Moira Anderson reading, My Dad Killed This Girl. Again, Sandra's name was not mentioned, but it did get people talking and speculating. Would this development lead to further evidence or witnesses coming forward? Well, it definitely led to Sandra receiving even more hostility from her family members, with her two brothers being furious and her mother breaking down in tears at this terrible secret coming out. Sandra realised, though, that her mother wasn't just angry at Sandra, she was also angry at herself angry and guilty that she had refused to see the signs, refused to believe that her husband, Alexander Gartshore, was not a good man. Following Sandra telling her side of the story to a trusted Scottish journalist and the newspaper being inundated with phone calls, many of whom were apparently from ex-police officers who agreed that the original investigation into Moira Anderson's disappearance was a joke, the journalist contacted Sandra to say she would be going to Leeds to confront Sandra's father to see if he would talk to them and give his side of the story and would Sandra like to join her. Sandra hesitated only momentarily before saying yes. She had longed to confront her father again ever since he had made that confession at the time of her grandmother's death in her grandmother's bedroom about a year and a half prior. Yes, she needed to do this. And so Sandra, the reporter and a photographer caught a flight to Leeds and finally, after a number of delays due to the weather, they made their way to confront Alexander Gartshore where he lived alone in a tower block. When they arrived, though, their plan of knocking on his door and catching him unawares was scuppered when they were faced with an intercom system. The trio looked at each other before deciding that Sandra would likely have the best bet of getting him to open the door to them. And so, with the photographer heading back to the car to wait until they could get Alexander outside for a better shot, and the reporter pressing record on the recorder that was hidden in her bag, Sandra took a deep breath, pressed the button for her father's flat, and waited. The line crackled, and Sandra said into the intercom who she was, and that she had come down from Edinburgh to see her dad. Silence followed, before Alexander Gartshore said, Is that you, love? Come on up before he buzzed her in. Sandra and the reporter exchanged a look before entering the tower block and making their way to the lift and the floor of Alexander's flat. As the lift doors opened, they could see Alexander slowly making his way towards them, smiling. Sandra told her father that the woman she had with her, the reporter, was a friend of hers and that Sandra wanted to speak to him for the sake of my sanity. Alexander looked at his daughter and her friend briefly before ushering them silently into his flat and closing the door. Sandra was surprised by her father's apparently warm welcome. Despite the allegations she had made against him, he didn't appear to be harbouring any animosity as he gestured for them all to sit down. 
The following day, next to the article that appeared in the newspaper that was written by the reporter who had accompanied Sandra that day to see her dead, was a photo that had been snapped by the newspaper's photographer, which showed Sandra with her head on the journalist's shoulder, weeping, while her father stood behind them, awkwardly smiling. What could have transpired in Alexander Gartshore's flat that day that could have caused Sandra such obvious grief? Upon Sandra, the journalist, and her father having sat down in his flat, Sandra and the journalist didn't stand on ceremony and immediately began firing questions at Sandra's father, imploring him to show some compassion and decency and tell them just what had happened to Moira the day she went missing in February 1957. However, Alexander was having none of it, saying that it was he who in fact needed compassion, with him then going on to give full details about his health and other problems he had. The journalist asked him why he had said what he had to Sandra in the bedroom of his grandmother's house following her passing, but he ignored this question and became agitated. He then went on to tell various stories, such as, yes, Moira had been on his bus the day she disappeared, but that she'd been with another girl, a friend, and maybe this girl could be traced, and she'd be able to back up his story that he had said bye to Moira and this mystery girl as they both left his bus, very much alive, which was exactly what he had told the police when they had interviewed him. Then he said that he had actually gotten off the bus at the same time as Moira and this mysterious friend. However, when Sandra jumped on this new piece of information, he quickly backtracked, saying that, oh, he meant that Moira and her mystery friend had left the bus first, but that he had got off the bus soon afterwards to allow the relief driver on, finishing by saying that the last time he saw Moira and her mystery friend, they were going through the doors of the shop Woolworths. He went on to say that he had told the police this back in 1957, when he had gone to the police station to make a statement but Sandra already knew that he had never been interviewed as part of the initial investigation, so more lies. The journalist then began to question him around the allegations of sexual abuse from Sandra's cousins, throwing dates, names and details at him to no avail, until one particular cousin of Sandra's name was mentioned, at which point Alexander sighed and said, Aye, you're right about her with it saying in Sandra's book, Where There Is Evil, that he then went on to say, I, I admit that I did touch her, but it was never the full thing, and that it had only been the one time, and that she'd been fifteen. When Sandra disagreed with this statement, saying that he had sexually abused her cousin most definitely more than once, and that she had in fact been eight years old the first time he had touched her, Alexander became angry, pacing his small living room and saying that everything that was being said about him was just lies, and he had no idea why they were telling such lies. And then he said something that left Sandra and the journalist speechless. He continued to rant in his living room about all the lies that had been told about him over the years, how he had kept count, and in fact there had been 122 children who had told lies about him, saying that he'd been interviewed 122 times by police about the lies the children had told about him, ending by saying that it was pathetic, that he was just being picked on, and that these children had nothing better to do than spread lies about him. Gaining her composure after this admission, Sandra quietly said to her father that he had always liked wee girls, been overly friendly with wee girls, and wanted to be in his own with them, to which he slowly nodded his head before lowering it. Believing that they were finally getting somewhere, that they were very close to getting an admission of some kind from Alexander, the journalist pushed on and asked if it was an impulse he had, and had he had this impulse all his life. This question was met by a long silence, where neither Sandra or the journalist dared move, dared breathe, and then finally Alexander replied with, I. Sandra said in her book that he continued with, I regret it. It's been with me all my life. It's just something that comes over me. I canna help it. Still happens, even now. Despite this admission, when the conversation turned back to Moira Anderson's disappearance, the mood changed and Alexander Gartshore was once again on the defensive, saying, according to Where There Is Evil, that, Look, I swear on my children's lives, up there and down here, I never touched that wee lassie Moira. This has come back to haunt me, but honest, I didn't. <laughs> 
he apparently spent the last 15 minutes of their two-hour visit saying that another Baxter bus driver was to blame for Moira Anderson's disappearance. Realising they were going to get nothing further from the visit, they made to leave, but Alexander decided he was going to accompany them down on the lift and see them out of the tower block properly. He was very malleable and gave them directions as the trio walked towards their hire car. All the while, the photographer was merrily clicking away, hoping to capture the perfect shot, while Alexander just accepted Sandra's story that the two people who had accompanied her to visit him were just her friends. But standing on the pavement outside her father's block of flats, looking at her father standing there, completely unaware of what was actually going on and that their whole conversation had been recorded, suddenly filled Sandra with immense guilt. Despite what this man had done to so many children, including Sandra herself, and of unlikely being involved in Moira Anderson's murder, Sandra hated herself for deceiving and manipulating her father, and she burst into tears right there on the street in front of him. At which point the journalist pulled Sandra towards her to comfort her, while Sandra's father stood behind them, awkwardly smiling. Now following Sandra receiving letters from the Lord Advocate after two members of Parliament had written to him asking that he review the decision made by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to not proceed with the sexual abuse case against Alexander Gartshore and the Lord Advocate standing by this decision, Sandra heard from one of the MPs, John Smith, who said that while he was concerned about Sandra's dad's pattern of behaviour and that he appeared to not have been interviewed during the initial inquiry into Moira Anderson's disappearance and about the sexual abuse stories her cousins had alleged, he said he regretfully could no longer continue to be involved. While Sandra wasn't completely surprised, she asked him why not, to which he apparently replied that while he found the Crown Office's decision to be somewhat inexplicable as he was the leader of the opposition, he could not afford to become embroiled in the situation with the Crown Office before then going on to commend Sandra for her public spiritedness in regard to the situation. Not willing to leave it at that, Sandra advised that she would be seeking legal advice and that she planned to go over the Lord Advocate Lord Roger's head and could John Smith advise her who the Lord Advocate's boss was to which there apparently was a great roar of laughter from the other end of the phone, before the MP, John Smith, went on to explain that in a unique feature of the Scottish legal system, the Lord Advocate role is a completely independent one. No one oversees the decisions that are made, and he is not accountable to anyone. The best John Smith could advise was for Sandra to write a letter to the Prime Minister, as if the Lord Advocate was to take notice of anyone, it would be the Prime Minister. And so, after seeking legal advice, Sandra did just that. It was now time for more waiting. 1994 came around, and still Sandra had heard nothing from the Prime Minister's office. She felt stuck, frustrated, and needed to do something, and so she did what Detective Jim McEwen had told her not to do. She sought to make contact with Moira Anderson's older sister, Janet, who was living in Australia in the hope that they could join forces in order to move things along. She was so pleased to discover that Janet too was frustrated, not just with the lack of movement around her sister's investigation, but at being on the other side of the world, and so she was more than happy to speak to Sandra, where, after hearing what Sandra had to say and had uncovered, she agreed they should join forces and work together to try and get justice with Janet saying to Sandra that, I'll always be grateful to you for doing all this and going to the police. During the phone call, though, Janet told Sandra a few surprising things, which again demonstrated the desire back in the 50s to keep certain things quiet. Janet told Sandra that not too long after Moira went missing, she had been approached near her home by a tall man in overalls who had asked her to, Come here, come and help me hold this leading Janet to his small black car and the bonnet at the front which was raised. As Janet approached, this man grabbed her, and according to where there is evil, he said, Hold this dipstick for me, would you? When Janet realised just what this man was asking her to hold, she was mortified and ran away. She told Sandra that this was reported to the local police as well as her school, but neither did anything about this, 
and Janet's dad, Andrew, would walk both her and her younger sister to and from school from there on in, as he had completely lost faith in the local police by this point. After Janet asked Sandra to describe what her father, Alexander Gartshore, looked like back then, Janet was convinced that the man who had indecently assaulted her had been Alexander Gartshore. But that wasn't the only thing Sandra found out from Janet. While Janet was on the other side of the world, her relatives back home in Coatbridge would visit the police station now and again to see if they could find out any updates or information for her in regard to her sister Moira's disappearance. And apparently when relatives had visited the police station recently, they had been told that Moira's case was now closed. Sandra told Janet that Detective Inspector Jim McEwen had been moved to another police station and wasn't as hands-on with Moira's investigation, but that it most definitely was not closed. Sandra vowed to try and find out what was going on and to keep Janet informed of any developments, with them both fearing that someone wanted the Moira Anderson case to disappear again. A couple of months after Sandra sent a letter to the Prime Minister requesting his involvement in the Lord Advocate's decision to not pursue the sexual abuse case against Alexander Gartshore by her cousins, Sandra finally received a reply, although not from the Prime Minister as he had passed Sandra's letter back to Scotland to the Secretary of State for Scotland, who had in turn passed it on to a civil servant for them to actually respond to Sandra's letter that she had sent to the Prime Minister. Despite Sandra's letter passing through many hands, the ultimate response was there was nothing the Prime Minister or Secretary of State for Scotland could do as the Lord Advocate was independent and could not be influenced, which was a fundamental feature of the criminal justice system in Scotland. Again, Sandra had hit a brick wall, but she was determined not to give up, and after receiving further advice, she then wrote to someone who sat in the House of Commons and another who sat in the House of Lords, requesting a meeting and who hopefully could take Sandra's case to their respective Houses of Parliament. Although it would only be Lord Macaulay from the House of Lords that would show interest in this and agree to meet Sandra. Before a meeting could be set up between Lord Macaulay and Sandra, though, Sandra received a phone call from Elizabeth Taylor Nimmo, who, back at the time of Moira's disappearance in 1957, had been good friends with Moira and had been called Beth. She was the same Beth that Sandra had seen that day in 1956 at the park with Moira, speaking with her father, the memory that she had recovered following her hypnosis, and the Beth that Sandra had been trying so hard to track down ever since her hypnosis session. Sandra desperately wanted to know what had transpired between Moira, Beth and her father that day at the park as well as finally settle in Sandra's mind whether her father knew exactly who Moira was, despite his ever-changing story around this. Beth told Sandra that while her and Moira were at the park that day in 1956, a man wearing a bus driver outfit that she didn't know called them both over to where he was working at the bonnet of his small black car, a man who apparently knew Moira and she him as they called each other by name. Sandra asked Beth what had taken place when they had gone to the car. Beth said that as her and Moira stood by the car, the man exposed himself to them, trying to get them to touch him in exchange for sweets. Beth said that her and Moira just laughed at this, before six-year-old Sandra appeared to see what her dad was up to with these two girls, at which point Beth and Moira ran away laughing. Beth and Sandra spoke for quite some time and Beth agreed she would go to the police station to make a statement about the events that took place in 1956. However, when she called Sandra after doing this, Sandra was perturbed to find out that, despite this new information, the police had shown little interest and Beth got the impression that the police just wanted this case to quietly go away. A meeting between Sandra and Lord Macaulay was then arranged, with the outcome being encouragement by Lord Macaulay for Sandra to continue to think about pursuing a private prosecution, going as far as lending Sandra a book about a private prosecution case which Lord Macaulay himself had been involved with as a young man to show Sandra what it entailed. 
Lord Macaulay, in his role as Shadow Lord Advocate, also agreed to see if he could find out further information about Sandra's cousin's case from the Crown Office. While it was found out that there was still the possibility that a case against Alexander Gartshore could still be pursued via a private prosecution, sadly, Sandra and her cousins just couldn't take the risk to go ahead with this due to the possible financial ramifications. So it was back to square one, but things were only to get worse. By April 1994, Detective Inspector Jim McEwen, who had led the reinvestigation into Moira's disappearance and who, despite moving to a different police station, had managed to continue in this role, had now been promoted again to Detective Chief Inspector, which brought to an end his involvement in any capacity in the reinvestigation of Moira Anderson's disappearance. Due to this, and it being deemed that there was no new relevant evidence or information in the case, and Moira's body not having been found, the reinvestigation into Moira's disappearance in 1957 again ground to a halt. With most avenues now apparently having been exhausted by Sandra, the only option remaining was for Sandra to write a book detailing everything that had happened, as despite the Procurator Fiscal and Crown Office Service ruling that it was not in the public interest to pursue the case against Alexander Gartshore sexually assaulting four female members of his family, Sandra felt that it was absolutely vital that the public were made aware of what Alexander Gartshore had done and at that time may have been continuing to do. Where There Is Evil was first published in 1998, three years after Sandra's mother died, having told Sandra that she knew there was no point in asking her not to write the book, but that she hoped it wouldn't be released in her lifetime. But that is not the end of the story. There is still so much to tell you such as about the deathbed confession, the unprecedented move by the Crown Office, and whether Moira ever receives justice. So join us next time for the conclusion.